David's title is Tales from the Bedside and <laughs> Clinic Room, Mere Ante Anecdotes or the Foundation of a Great Understanding of Disease Pathogenesis. And I'm not even going to begin to comment on that. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Hutton. So no heckling, please. <laughs> so uh, we'll move on. So, as David said, I, uh, I've done some research as regards uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And some of this talk is going to be about rheumatoid arthritis. I know you might not find that frustrating if you're interested in lupus, but there are some interesting parallels, um, and, and we'll cover those as, as we go along. So, as a rheumatologist, I see about 2,000 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So when I look at a pair of hands like this, uh, a poster saying that uh, smoking can trigger rheumatoid arthritis, the first thing I think of is what type of rheumatoid arthritis has that person got? Because when you see a lot of patients, and they're very familiar with the disease, you see subgroups, important subgroups. And uh, I look at this pair of hands and I think, Actually, I'm not sure they've even got rheumatoid arthritis. It very much looks like osteoarthritis to me. So, if I was going to design a poster for stop smoking with rheumatoid arthritis, I would probably put <coughs> an ambiguous type of rheumatoid arthritis on, such as nodular rheumatoid arthritis, where you get big lumps under the tissues, and that's unmistakably rheumatoid arthritis when you've got rheumatoid <coughs> arthritis and these nodules. So if I was choosing a poster, then the patient would have nodular rheumatoid arthritis. And as David said, um, smoking accounts for a third of all cases of rheumatoid arthritis. And we'll go through other risk factors as time goes on. So I did do some studies that put, was part of my MD. And my MD was looking at certain detoxifying enzymes and cigarette smoking, but that's that's not the most important thing, really. The whole premise for the, for the thesis, I hadn't done rheumatology before, I'd applied to do an ITU job on a Burns unit as a registrar in, in the northwest in Liverpool. So it's a regional centre, and as part of it, I had to do some rheumatology, and I'd never done any rheumatology before, and the on call the night before was absolute nightmare, I was late for the clinic and it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was already dark, it was in a place called St Helens, it was all smoky and fuming, driving along. I thought, my goodness, it really is grim up north. <laughs> so I got there and there was about 100 patients with rheumatoid arthritis waiting in this clinic room and I looked through this little window I looked at them and I thought, my goodness, I think I know what causes rheumatoid arthritis because they looked just like the people that I clerk in day in, day out as a medical registrar with chronic obstructive airways disease. So there were some parallels just from that observation <coughs> and talking to the patients about their smoking histories and their airways disease, then the thesis was born and, and went from there. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease has a lot of parallels with rheumatoid arthritis. And of course, chronic obstructive airways disease is very closely linked to cigarette smoking. And that was a big clue about the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. And that's uh, uh, proven the case with other risk factors when it comes to the environment. So why do we do research? And I think, I personally think that we all should do research as doctors. It keeps your mind fresh, it's challenging. It gives better opportunities to patients, you know, new treatments at a newer stage, all those sorts of things bring fresh faces into the department and all those benefits. But the real reason that I do it, because I'm a big believer in this, is that you need a consensus to emerge by lots of people doing research. Even if it's thousands of doctors writing case reports about something, then you can look in the medical literature and then put those case reports together and get a better understanding of certain diseases. So if we go to a model 
where you have specialist centres, just one or two in a country, particularly for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, which is a common disease, can affect up to 1% of the general population. That might be a mistake. For rarer diseases like lupus, then obviously you need to concentrate expertise and the patients will have to travel to get a specialist opinion so that those doctors are seeing lots of patients with lupus. So it depends on how common the disease is, but I'm a big believer in as many people doing research as possible. And this was championed by a chap called Sir Francis Galton. And he was a, a famous statistician. He was a polymath. So that means he had lots of interests, and he was a scholar in lots of different things. So he discovered fingerprints, he was a traveller, an explorer, he was a very important statistician. And what he did, and he published this in Nature in 1906, is he went to a county fair in Devon, and he invited people for a prize, so there had to be experts, whatever that means, so they had to pay quite a high fee for taking part, and they had to guess the weight of an ox for a cash prize. So there might have been butchers, there might have been livestock specialists, there might have been farmers, there might have been housewives who had an interest, etc. And what he did, 800 people put their answers down, then he took the average, and that average was almost spot on as to what the weight of that ox was. So that's the importance of, of taking a group of people with diversity, who are experts, putting them in a room, and then getting a consensus, and hopefully coming up with the right answer. So I'm a big believer in that. And not to be too political, but some of the cabinets we've had relatively recently haven't been particularly diverse at all. So, for example, going to the same school, all the courts that have come going to the same school, isn't anywhere near diversity. So what is an expert? Well, I think Malcolm Gladwell's definition is, is particularly good. I don't know whether you've read any of his books, but he's a, a big component of the 10,000 hour rule. So you have to have done something for 10,000 hours before you're an expert. So I often tell my kids this, when they're doing their running, well, they were doing it before they played Fortnite, etc. <laughs> they're experts at that, that's for sure. <clears throat> I'd say it's practice, 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 and that's how you'll, you'll get good at something. But, so 10,000 hours, so, so for a rheumatologist like myself, if it takes 15 minutes to see a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, then it takes approximately 23 years. So. I've been a rheumatologist, or doing rheumatology for about that time. So I could claim to be an expert, but, but on, on the other flip side, prior to that, I wasn't an expert at all. So it takes a long time to accumulate that sort of knowledge so that you really understand the subject. <coughs> and I think this definition by uh, uh, William Osler, as regards the importance of clinical medicine. And here, I'll read it out, and he says, medicine is learned by the bedside and not in the classroom. Let not your conceptions of disease come from words heard in the lecture room or read from the book. See, and then reason, and compare and control, but see first. So that's important, because a lot of people are doing research now, particularly in my field, are all epidemiologists. They've never seen a case of rheumatoid arthritis. So how can they truly be experts in the true sense of the word? So you need a, some kind of middle way, because it's all about big data now, and big data sets, and epidemiologists crunching the numbers, but things can get missed. So these are some of the anecdotes I want to share with you, and hopefully, that will be of some relevance to you. And this is uh, an anecdote when I was a registrar. We used to use a lot of methyl prednisolone, huge doses of steroids, to treat refractory rheumatoid arthritis. Unfortunately, there was no other treatment. Patients' lives had come to a standstill, were often 
bedridden, so he used to infuse me methylprednisolone. And on one occasion, the patient that was supposed to return for three infusions was admitted with a perforation of the bowel. And I discussed this with colleagues, and they said they'd seen similar complications over the, the years, immediately after the use of steroids, when it came to diverticular disease. So if patients had got diverticular disease, sometimes, unfortunately, as a complication of their treatment, they get got a perforated diverticular abscess, which is quite an, an important and serious complication of their treatment with a mortality of 20%. So I thought it was important that we write our experience as a mini case series, which we did, and then we did a case control study that showed that indeed giving steroids increased the risk of that complication by 30 fold. So it was an important finding, which is now reasonably well known, <coughs> which came about as a consequence of discussing with colleagues and observing things at the bedside. <coughs> now, one of quite a memorable patient I looked after was a uh, 19 year old law student. And I was looking after. And she had a, a, a tentative diagnosis of lupus, but what's actually wrong with her was that she had sight-threatening optoneuritis, and she had an inflammatory condition of the spine, which would it could have rendered her such that she would be unable to use her arms or legs. So she had a myelopathy, it's called. So we made the assumption that it was an inflammatory process that would respond to immunosuppression and we gave her the appropriate uh, treatment and she got better. And her mother was the chief midwife at the hospital, a Nigerian lady who was quite formidable and the case was quite challenging as it was and she would ring me on a daily basis for an update. <laughs> so it was quite a memorable case for lots of reasons. So we thought she might have a condition called Devix Neurogenitis <coughs> Optica, which is a very rare condition which was previously thought to be a subform of multiple sclerosis. So when I moved on to different hospitals where there was a specialist neurology centre, we collected three or four cases with similar symptoms and looked at whether they had lupus or not. And they had features to suggest lupus, so they had positive autoantibodies and their lymphocyte count was low, but they didn't have full-blown lupus by any means. The main issue was they had optic neuritis and they had inflammation in their spinal cord. And the neurologists looking after them didn't think they had multiple sclerosis because their scans didn't show any evidence of multiple sclerosis within their brain. So it was in the process of writing up this case series and I sort of thought about it and I thought, well actually, they haven't got lupus they have got an autoimmune flavour. We have given image suppression to all these patients, like did the, the first girl who was, who was the law student, and they got better. So I hypothesised that this condition was actually an autoimmune condition. And that got published, and a couple of years later, a big group from America, the Mayo Clinic, showed that in fact, those patients had a specific autoantibody in their blood that distinguished them from patients with multiple sclerosis, and they were able to distinguish these patients, give them minimus suppression, and they got better. So I thought that was a big breakthrough, and in my na naivety, then, I was still a registrar, I assumed that my publication might have led to perhaps the Mayo Clinic going on to, to do that work. But now, as it turns out, unfortunately, rather cynically, in my old age, if you do find anything and publish on it, it takes at least five years for anything meaningful to happen. So I strongly suspect that their work was just a coincidence and they were doing that anyway. Because it takes years to generate these ideas and to get the lab support and the grants through, etc. So I strongly suspect they were working on that as I was writing that case report. So. I am indebted to David, um, he asked me to give a talk about, I think it was five years ago, about lupus, and I thought I need to really pad the talk out and talk about rheumatoid arthritis as well. So, 
sort of in a semi-jokey way, I, I looked on the internet to look at famous people, or celebrities as they're known, with rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, and we compared the group and talked about various epidemiological factors that might, might increase the risk of lupus. And that observation really then catapulted me into some of my most recent work that I'll show you, which, because it was so striking when we looked at rheumatoid arthritis. So if you look at this list here, you have to bear in mind that rheumatoid arthritis in men is about 40 times more common than, in, than lupus. So if you go onto the internet and try and look for famous individuals who are male with rheumatoid arthritis, there is a very sh short list. And one of them, Renoir, was around in the 1800s. Whereas lupus, you can see there's a much longer list here, a much rarer condition. So that's a bit strange. And then this li list is stranger still. So you might not recognise any of those names. I didn't, to be honest, until I looked on Wikipedia. I didn't know who most of these people were. <coughs> Essentially, eight of them are from the United States of America. Four of those guys are black Americans. And of course, 12% of the United States is, uh, is black. So, black population seems to be overrepresented in that list. So, there's a sort of ethnic connotation with lupus that doesn't appear to be true for rheumatoid arthritis. All those three guys are white. So, it's a real puzzle. Why, <coughs> when in Cornwall, we're looking after 800 men with rheumatoid arthritis? So, that's 0.4% of the male adult population. So these people really do exist, but if you go onto the internet, you wouldn't know they do exist. Not in terms of <coughs> celebrities or fame, etc. And I was really puzzled by this, so I had a good think about it. But in Renoir's case, he had definite rheumatoid arthritis. He had the nodular form of disease, and he had these nodules removed, and that's well chronicled. So we know for absolute certain that he had rheumatoid arthritis. So if I was going to design a poster, you can see Renoir smoking here, and that's a pair of rheumatoid hands, not that other patient. So he had definite rheumatoid arthritis. So going back to the COPD story, went back to that, thought, is there anything else that triggers COPD other than smoking? And I found a few publications. But you can see here, going up this axis here, this is your risk of developing chronic obstructive airways disease. So if you've never smoked, or you've had no exposure to various vapours, gases, dusts or fumes in the workplace, your risk of developing that disease is non-existent. Hmm. Then, if you are exposed to those exposures at work, but you don't smoke, there's a very modest increased risk. And then if you smoke, the risk starts to climb, so it's about a <coughs> seven-fold increased risk. But it's when you put those two risks together. It doesn't add together, it multiplies up. We'll just go back. So you can see here, if you're a working class guy working on a building site, exposed to cement dust, and you're smoking in your break, then you're the type of person who has the highest risk of developing COPD. So it's not smoking per se, it's something about the co-exposure that puts that risk up tremendously. And lo and behold, the same thing's true in rheumatoid arthritis. There'd already been some research done in Sweden looking at silica exposure. So most individuals exposed to silica are builders because it's, it's found in cement dust, etc., in the bricks that they cut them and all that. So exactly the same thing. If you smoke heavily and you're exposed to silica, there's about a 15-fold increased risk of disease. So striking parallels with COPD. So we've gone on to do research in Cornwall, noting in the literature all the jobs associated with an increased risk of rheumatoid arthritis 
all involved inhalation of various dust or fumes in the workplace, with unfortunately tarmacers here having the greatest risk with a 14-fold increased risk. So this is our results of the 800 men in Cornwall with rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see this group here, who'd never smoked and no exposure to vapors, gas, dust or fumes, their overall prevalence was only 8% of the total population. So that was unusual to start with. And their average rheumatoid factor was tiny at 24. So most of those patients had very mild disease. <coughs> at the other end of the spectrum, if you had two exposures to vapors, gas, dust or fumes, and you smoked, then your rheumatoid factor was a much more meaningful 113. So some striking difference, and in the middle was patients who had either smoked alone or had exposures to vapors, gas, dust, or fumes alone. Unfortunately, in Cornwall, because of the social demographics, nearly three quarters of the men are actually at this end. So this disease, these 800 men, a lot of them needn't have rheumatoid arthritis. It's totally preventable. Smoking, dust or fume exposure. So it's food for thought, because in Cornwall, for biologic therapists, we're spending about £7 million per annum. So it has a huge cost to society and a huge cost to these guys, because if you're a builder and your risks are bad, then the chances of staying in work are quite low. So some specifics to Cornwall, we were quite interested in the St. Austell area because my clinic in St. Austell was where most of the patients had the most severe disease, a lot of nodular rheumatoid, which we've mentioned before, and in St. Austell, they produce china clay, and then they dry it in drying rooms. So most of the patients had worked in the drying rooms, and in fact, 80% of the world's china clay had come from St. Austell. We employed about 70,000 people at one stage, but there's hardly anyone works there now. And also, specific to Cornwall, was boat building, so there's about 2% of the working population work with wood dust, as opposed to 1% of the general population in the UK, so slightly higher in Cornwall. And these are the specific results for the China clay workers. You can see the same trend. So these are the control patients with no smoking and no china clay. Their average rheumatoid factor was about 20. And then you had smokers who'd been exposed to china clay. Their rheumatoid factors were about 150. So, and the other two were in between, either just uh, control smokers or uh, china clay without smoking. So the china clay alone put the rheumatoid factors up quite substantially. And what was interesting is that these guys, almost a quarter of them, had nodular rheumatoid, as opposed to the general population of Cornwall, the rheumatoid population, of about 11%. And a similar thing was seen in guys who'd worked as a carpenters. There was an increased risk of rheumatoid factor in those who smoked and were just exposed with an average room to back to about 150. So a clear interaction between two environmental stimuli dependent on your job. So back to Renoir. So we mentioned that he had nodular rheumatoid. So on average, a chap with nodular rheumatoid will have a rheumatoid factor of about 150. So that puts Renoir in this sort of group a smoker and greater than two exposures to vapours, gas, dust and fumes. And when you look into Renoir's life, it becomes quite apparent that he did have multiple exposures to inhalation insults. He was born in Limoges, which is the home of the china clay industry. So his family had a lot of connections. So when they moved to Paris, they still had connections with the china clay industry. And essentially, they lived in Paris, overlooking the Louvre, which sounds quite romantic, but it was actually a slum. There were seven of them living in a single apartment. Two of his siblings died before they were five. So he lived in poverty. He left school at 14 and went to work in a porcelain factory, inhaling China clay for six years. 
was a lifelong smoker and worked with pastels, so he was exposed to dust. So actually, Renoir did occupations, but exposed him to dust, and he was a lifelong smoker, like those guys in Cornwall. So what about lupus? Well, there is an association between double-stranded DNA type lupus and smoking. And you can see here that smokers have about double the risk of lupus. But interestingly, and very different from rheumatoid arthritis, if you quit smoking, the risk returns to as if you'd never smoked at all within five years. So that's good news for relatives of individuals who've got lupus, if they do stop smoking, within five years that risk of disease is negated somewhat when it comes to smoking. <coughs> Whereas rheumatoid arthritis, this is heavy smoking, so 20 pack years, so that's 20 a day, every day for 20 years. You can see current smokers have an increased risk of developing rheumatoid arthritis of nearly threefold. If they've given up before diagnosis, the risk is still fourfold. 10 to 20 years smoking sensation, almost the same as current smoking. I'll just go back, sorry. And here, even after 20 years, there's a risk that still goes on. So for rheumatoid arthritis, the legacy is very much longer uh, compared to lupus. So when I see patients in clinic, this is a, a lady by, by coincidence I just saw yesterday. And that does sound like a hell of a coincidence, but given the fact that I do see her about three times a year, and I always see her on a Friday morning, and these meetings are always on a Saturday, actually the chances of that is one in 15. <laughs> a chance of one in 120 million of having lupus and myasthenia gravis, which is what she's got. She had lupus for about 20 years and then developed myasthenia gravis. So clearly, either lupus increases your risk of myasthenia gravis, the treatment that she was on somehow increased the risk, or as an individual, she was incredibly susceptible to autoimmune per se. And that may be her main problem, the susceptibility to autoimmunity. And it just so happens that the two diseases she has are lupus and myasthenia gravis. So this is some research showing the clustering of autoimmune diseases. And you can see, for example, vitiligo seems to cluster with autoimmune thyroid disease and other autoimmune diseases. So these diseases don't always come alone. So a general tendency towards autoimmunity appears to be important. And in lupus, for example, David Eisenberg's research some time ago shows an increased prevalence of thyroid disease in lupus patients. So it's important as a, as a lupus patient that you do have your thyroid function checked on a regular basis. So he found the prevalence of autoimmune thyroid disease to be 7% and the expected rate of the general population is about 2%. Here's a lady I look after who's got shin splints. Now, they usually occur in athletes, people who are doing lots of training. She just walked to the shop and back, didn't do any particular exercise. And she was a patient with lupus who was very fastidious about using sunblock. So she was vitamin D deficient. But I see lots of patients who are vitamin D deficient, rheumatoid arthritis, other conditions, and I've never seen them present with vitamin D. And it made me wonder, could there be something about the body's reaction to vitamin D that's different in somebody with lupus? And I did find some interesting research to suggest from the John Hopkins that low vitamin D levels may increase the risk of kidney disease in the context of lupus because vitamin D is a modifier of the immune system. So in some people, low levels may have more of a profound effect than in other individuals. So if you are using a lot of sunblock, you're very photosensitive, then make sure your vitamin D levels have been checked because it's not just bone health that's important. There's 
important cancers like breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer in, in guys, obviously, there's an increased risk if you've been vitamin D deficient. So just, just be aware of that. So ethnicity, I touched on this with the, the famous guys with lupus. Four out of the <coughs> eight uh, were black. And you can see in the Cornish RA population, in total, we've got 3,000 patients, 99% of them are either white British or white Cornish. And yet, of five patients admitted to HDU and ITU in Cornwall, with a diagnosis of lupus, three out of five were from uh, either an Afro-Caribbean background, Southeast Asian or Chinese descent. So clearly ethnicity is of huge importance when it becomes either to susceptibility or severity of lupus. And this study here ties up two of the things that I've been trying to touch on. This study looked at 65,000 patients with autoimmune disease, some of whom, 14,000, had SLE, and they found two things. They found that SLE patients were younger and more than five times more likely to have multiple autoimmune diseases, which again suggests that some individuals are more predisposed to autoimmunity per se rather than to a specific disease. And secondly, non-Caucasian patients were more likely to have a more severe form of lupus compared to the white counterparts. And finally, lupus and Epstein-Barr virus, the glandular fever virus, so countless times when I've met patients or we've discussed them in groups, these sorts of meetings, how prevalent it is where patients have been hospitalised with Epstein-Barr virus as teenagers, very severe disease, and, and then the lupus has developed some time after. I, looked, I was looking after a lady, but she was diagnosed with an inflammatory arthritis. She'd gone on some foreign travel. There were some clues that she might have lupus all along. She was on a treatment called methotrexate for a joint disease, and she was doing very well. And then after the foreign travel, She's presented with a fever, pericarditis, and a life-threatening hemolytic anemia. Because she'd had foreign travel, all her virus serology was checked, and it became apparent that she had very raised levels of the Epstein-Barr virus. But she also had very high levels of double-stranded DNA, and it was uncertain because glandular fever can cause a severe hemolytic anemia and a swinging fever. Whether it was a lupus causing the problem or whether it was an infection with severe glandular fever. So I spoke to the haematologists and they said, well, we treat. When we see our patients who are immunosuppressed and they've got Epstein-Barr virus, we can actually treat them with a treatment called rituximab. And that obviously works for lupus as well. So she was treated with rituximab and went into full remission. But it's interesting that she should have high levels of Epstein-Barr virus in association with a presumed flare of her lupus. And we would have, ne we would have not done those titers unless she'd had the foreign travel. So it's interesting there is that link. So my closing thoughts on lupus are, why is the disease so much more prevalent in young women compared to men? Why is ethnicity so important in terms of susceptibility and outcome? Why are some individuals predisposed to multiple autoimmune diseases? What is the role of vitamin D? And what is the role of environmental factors such as EBV? Thank you very much.